Thank you everyone for joining me today uh, for the first webinar in the uh, in our series in our series for the open education resources community of practice. So this is all about uh, the basics of open education resources. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the Ghana people, the traditional custodians of the Adelaide Plains and the land on which the University of Adelaide's campuses at North Terrace, Waite and Roseworthy are built. I acknowledge the deep feelings of attachment and relationship of the Ghana people to country and respect and value their past, present and ongoing connection to the land and cultural beliefs. I should have started by saying I'm Tom. I'm the coordinator of artificial intelligence literacy and open educational resources with the University of Adelaide Library. So today what I'm going to cover are the basics of what are open educational resources in the first place and why would we want to use and create them. I'll then share a bit about our membership in the Australian and New Zealand Open Educational Resources Collective and some of the benefits that come with that and some of, our, some of the opportunities that are available to staff at the University of Adelaide for publishing open educational resources, including some grants that um, will soon become available. So as I said, um, I'll be presenting today's session. I'm Tom from the University Library, uh, coordinate artificial intelligence literacy and open educational resources, support and advocacy for the library. Uh, my background is in educational technology, innovation management and uh, information literacy support. Uh, but for the last few years, I've been driving this, uh, this effort to try and uh, support and advocate for open education resources at the University of Adelaide. This webinar is part of a monthly series we're going to be delivering throughout this year. And it's part of the Open Education Resources Community of Practice, which is a forum for academic and professional staff from across the university to collaborate, learn, and share advice in the discovery, use, and creation of open educational resources. This, this is a really good opportunity for staff from across disciplines, from across uh, organizational units, for academic and professional staff to uh, share what they know about open resources and learn a little bit about um, what's happening around the university, around Australia and around the world. Uh, this is just one of several uh, communities of practice that are available to staff at the university in various areas of learning and teaching. And so if you're not already a member of uh, a community of practice, I'd encourage you to have a look, have a look at what's out there and available. I'm one of the conveners of the Open Educational Resources Community of Practice. Uh, I'm joined by my uh, colleague, Matt Lumsden, uh, academic support librarian with the library's learning support team. And um, he's also one of the conveners. And so for the webinars going forward uh, for each month uh, throughout the year, we're going to be taking turns with who's hosting each session. And so you've got me today, but uh, in the future, you, you may also have Matt. And he is also on the call here today. So um, he may chime in later on if I get anything wrong, I'm sure. Uh, so these webinars are available to anybody at the university who would like to join and dip their toe into learning about open education resources. Uh, there's no particular need to have to join the community of practice to join these webinars and uh, learn something. Uh, but there are a few additional benefits that you may want to look at um, to, uh, if you'd like to commit a little bit further and uh, uh, learn a little bit more and contribute to open educational practice at the university. If you join the community of practice, you will receive automatic calendar invites for all of the future webinars. So you won't have to remember to have a look at the program and uh, register when the registration links become available. They'll just be directly into your calendar and you can decide which ones you would uh, be interested in attending um, if you join the community of practice. And also um, all of the people who are signed up as members of the community of practice will automatically receive uh, links to the recordings from these webinars as well. By joining the community of practice, you also get access to a Teams channel that we can use to collaborate and share information um, about, open about open educational resources as well. And uh, as a member of the community of practice, you'll also receive a monthly newsletter um, that Matt and I will collate about open education resource news from around the world and around Australia, including the recordings from these webinars. Uh, for those of you who are already members of the community of practice, you'll, you might have noticed that you ha we haven't sent one out yet for this year. So we will be sending one out shortly after this session, which will also include the recording from the session and some other news that has come up in the meantime since we sent one late last year. And uh, once you have a bit of a uh, uh, 
active membership base in this community of practice, we're going to start organizing some social networking events as well so that we can get to know each other outside of these more formal structured sessions. Um, the community of practice is still relatively new. We began middle of last year. We've only had a couple of meetings so far, um, but we're really keen to get um, as many people involved as we can. And if you follow the QR code there or follow this link, which Matt has also posted in the chat, um, you'll be able to see the whole program of the OER community of practice webinars going forward and information about how you could join if you're interested in joining. As I said, this is the first of a series of webinars um, that we will be running throughout the year. This first one is a general introduction for open educational resources. Uh, and this is being held during Open Education Week, which I will have a bit more information about that in just a second. Uh, next month, we'll be looking at how open educational resources can empower different kinds of innovative pedagogies and different teaching practices, and including particularly how uh, some academics are using open educational resources as a way to enable student partnership and co-creation of uh, teaching, working with students um, in collaboration. The, in May, we'll be looking at how open resources can be inclusive by design and can and how open resources can be accessible and embed principles of diversity, equity and inclusion to make education more accessible for everybody. In June, we'll be looking at how we can find different kinds of open resources and the different types of quality assurance uh, processes and systems that uh, are in place to make sure that the open resources that we create and that we discover and uh, provide to students are high quality and that we're not sacrificing uh, the quality of those resources by having them be open access. In July, we'll look at how some institutions and how some academics are using open resources to uh, collaborate across disciplines and across institutions. So there's a lot of uh, good work that happens around the world with people collaborating across institutions to create common open educational resources that can be useful for uh, all students within a particular discipline. So if there's a particular first year core subject in a big discipline, for example, some institutions around the world have collaborated to create an open access resource for any students within that, taking a course like that can be set rather than um, recreating pockets of uh, content around the place. So we'll be exploring that in July. In August, we will be looking at visions of a cost-free curriculum, so how some institutions have been uh, really driving, looking at, at, a, at a program level, how can you minimise or eliminate the need for students to have to uh, pay for resources above and beyond what they already need to pay for tuition fees. In September, we'll be looking at different strategies and different ways that people around the world are advocating for open educational resources and some of the toolkits and strategies that are out there to help enable this. And then in October, we'll be looking at how open education fits with broader open movements. And so that's there's open access resource publishing, open source software, open culture movements. For decades, there's been a whole heap of different kinds of open resource uh, of open movements for advocating for the open uh, creation and uh, distribution of knowledge and information. And so we'll be looking at how open education uh, fits within that. Um, and during October is also Open Access Week, um, which is particularly focused on open access resource, uh, open access research publishing, but also open education resource. So that's a good month to uh, look at the intersections there. In November, we'll be exploring how artificial intelligence, uh, particularly generative artificial intelligence, relates and impacts open educational resources. So that might be how generative AI can be used to streamline the creation of new content within, within open education resources and make it even uh, a little bit easier to create new material, but also how the openness of open education resources might, uh, what, what ethical and legal implications there might be with creating open uh, open content that then can be fed into training data for commercial systems, which is a, a similar challenge that needs to be explored with open data and open research as well. So we'll be exploring some of those challenges and opportunities in November. And then in December, we'll be uh, reflecting on what we've learned throughout the year and what our plans are for 2025. Now, this whole program here are uh, penciled in so that we had something uh, 
to guide us going forward. But all of these topics are open for negotiation and change depending on the interests of the community and based on the availability of guest speakers that we're going to try and get involved. So we would like as much as possible to have uh, to hear from different viewpoints and active practitioners um, of how they're uh, engaging with this material. So um, this is the draft for, uh, the draft program and it may shift and change as things get more um, put in. And the link and QR code is still there too. The full uh, program is on the Community of Practice uh, website and we will update that as things change. And that is one of the other benefits of joining the Community of Practice is that we will send those updates directly through into calendars as well. So um, it can be easy to keep, keep up to date in that way. As I said, this is Open Education Week uh, this week, which is run by an institution called Open Education Global. So this week is focused on uh, the celebration and advocacy for what institutions around the world are doing to support open educational resources and open educational practice more generally. So if you go to the Open Education Week website, you'll see there are over 100, I think 120, 130 or something events happening from around the world on all different aspects of open education. And that can be a really good place to go and see what other people are doing. Many, many of those sessions are open and in multiple different languages from places around the world as well. So let's dive into the content of today's session. Uh, so we're going to start off with a fairly basic question, but what are open educational resources? When I'm talking about open education resources, what I'm thinking about are digital learning materials that are made freely available using an open license such as Creative Commons, allowing them to be freely downloaded, kept, shared, and revised by anyone. Uh, in the library space, we often think about open textbooks because open educational resources are a really good way uh, to address some of the challenges that we currently have with traditional commercial textbook publishing. But we're, we're not only thinking about open textbooks necessarily, we're thinking about any, any materials, uh, typically digital because that's how we can freely distribute these things, um, learning and teaching materials that are freely available for anyone to download, keep, share and revise. And um, we'll, we'll dive into that into a bit more detail in just a second. A very common way that people uh, uh, frame open educational resources is David Wiley's five R's of OERs. So these are five uh, freedoms effectively that people who use OERs gain uh, that may be different to other types of resources published under different kinds of uh, rights regimes. Open educational resources uh, allow people to retain those resources so that people can download and keep copies without technical or legal restrictions preventing them from downloading and keeping those. So that's as opposed to some uh, commercial uh, eBooks that may uh, restrict whether people can download offline to read it offline. And they may include uh, what's called digital rights management that uh, controls how those resources can be interacted with. Uh, open education resources allow the people using those materials to retain and keep those resources indefinitely. OERs allow people to revise them. So people are able to adapt and modify copies and republish those adaptations, which allows people to uh, build upon the work of others. And so that content doesn't get locked away in a particular form as it gets published. People can take an open resource and if it's close to what they need, but not quite there, they can take a copy of that adapt it in some way, add their own contributions, and then republish the, that adaptation as a, a new version that may be better suited for their particular context. So for example, we could take a uh, open education resources uh, resource from a North American university and adapt it to an Australian context um, without having to start from scratch. Open education resources also allow you to remix the resources. Uh, that allows you to take bits and pieces from different open resources and mix them together to create a new, a new resource. So for example, you could take a block of text from one open textbook, for example, and a video that's been published under a Creative Commons license and a, a public domain image from somewhere else and mix all of that together and create a new resource. 
OERs also allow people to reuse them. And so that is reusing the, con the uh, resource that they've downloaded and use that in other contexts. So OERs don't restrict you to only using it in the particular context that you first engage with it. So some uh, uh, commercial resources are very limited in the in the uh, the license that's allowed to be used. So for example, an open uh, com commercial traditional textbook might only be allowed to be used in a one particular course that that was purchased for. Uh, open resources don't add those types of restrictions. They can be reused and repurposed for um, other contexts. And finally, OERs allow people to redistribute those uh, copies of the resource. So that means that if you download an open education resource, you can then uh, share that with other people freely without uh, without much limitation. And also the adaptations, be able to be able to share the adaptations of those resources. Now, there are probably very few open educational resources that actually fully tick all of these boxes. Uh, depending on the licensing that is used to share the open resource, some of these uh, freedoms are more limited than others, but um, there are often very good reasons for restricting some of these freedoms over others. So for example, uh, if you have a resource that has indigenous knowledges embedded within it, and a key part of that is ensuring that that information and that knowledge is owned and controlled by First Nations people. Uh, it it's, uh, makes sense to actually restrict who and how that material is remixed and redistributed. So you can still have open resources that don't tick all of these boxes, but this is the sort of paradigm that we're going for um, in, in general, unless there's good reasons not to go for these. Um, now, hopefully, this works. Um, it's always a bit. It's always a bit of a hit and miss whether these embedded videos work within a, a Zoom call. But um, uh, this is just a quick video from, I believe it's the University of uh, Alberta. Yeah, um, about the what and the why of open resources, which um, reframes a little bit of what I've just presented in a slightly different uh, way. Um, Canada is very good for open resources. There's a lot of really good uh, federally uh, funded programs for creating and sharing uh, these resources in a common platform that many of the larger universities use. Um, but this is, a, this is just a snapshot in the what and the why of open resources. Um, so hopefully that seems like it uh, was consistent with what, we've, what I've just been sharing, um, that open education is a really good way of both making education more equitable um, and allowing a greater uh, diversity of students to be able to engage with higher education but it also provides some benefits for uh, teaching staff in how, um, in the uh, uh, flexibility and the kinds of practices that can be uh, used in the classroom. So why would we engage with open educational resources? We've seen some of the reasons already, uh, but open education resources are both free and free. So what do I mean by that? Open resources are free as in zero cost in that they don't cost students to uh, access these materials and they don't cost institutions like academic libraries in having to provide these uh, resources to learners and teachers. And I, the only reason I say nearly free is that it's really important to recognize that it does take uh, resources to uh, advocate and to provide these materials in the, in the way of uh, infrastructure to make them more easily discoverable and uh, the, the labor that it actually takes for uh, subject matter experts and, and academic staff to create these resources. So that there are costs involved in distributing these and making these available, um, but critically, it doesn't cost the learner who is uh, engaging with that material. Uh, it doesn't cost them to actually access it and it doesn't cost institutions. Uh, the institutions don't have to pay licensing fees um, to make these available. But Open resources are also free as in freedom. So there's a saying in the open so software movement that this is uh, think free speech, not free beer. Uh, this is uh, open resources also uh, provide more flexibility and freedom in how these resources can be used, both by the teaching staff who are providing them to students and integrating that, that into their curriculum, but also to the learners who are interacting with that material and um, uh, using those to further their learning. 
Uh, they don't have the same kind of restrictive uh, access uh, uh, limitations, both the technical and the legal, that come with other kinds of resources. And, and so they can be they can make a curriculum and learning experience uh, more freeing than other commercial uh, resources. And we'll, again, we'll just um, dive into that in a little bit more detail in just a moment. So if we focus on the cost side, uh, some of the uh, one of the problems with uh, traditional commercially published textbooks are that they are very expensive. And in fact, they are getting more expensive over time. And the cost of these textbooks over the last uh, few years have largely uh, outpaced the rate of inflation. They've become more and more expensive, both relative to the wider economy and relative to the uh, ability for individual students to afford to purchase them. Uh, some stats I was looking at, it, uh, I think there's a video a little bit later on actually, that shows that the price has gone up something like 80% just in the last 10 years. And I was reading some sources that saying the price was even going up around 1000% since the 1970s. Um, and this is largely driven by uh, the centralization um, of the larger textbook publishers. There's only around five of the major textbook publishers. And so they are able to exert a lot of market power in how they actually price their textbooks. Um, and, the, and there's limited ability for uh, either the individual students or the teaching staff or the libraries to uh, negotiate on what the price of these resources are. So according to this uh, Universities Australia Student Finances Survey in 2017, students are spending an average in Australia of around $1,300 a year on study related expenses. Um, and that's on top of the actual tuition fees that come with study. And this figure includes the cost of the textbook that they need to purchase. Unfortunately, I haven't got, um, I couldn't find similar information for more, more uh, uh, recent than 2017, but I suspect the situation hasn't changed all that much. Uh, for some students, this is a really big figure. Um, but for some people, this, uh, this expense wouldn't be that much and is easily, easily absorbed. But for many students, this is, uh, this is the difference between attending university and not attending university, and then what their future career and life looks like. So for example, this particular undergraduate indigenous full-time student who's quoted here, um, finds it very difficult in order to afford their textbooks. Uh, they need to live off around $1,000 a fortnight, and it takes this person roughly eight weeks of keeping money aside to be able to purchase their needed books, uh, which in many courses, if the textbooks uh, that are required aren't promoted eight weeks in advance, and if students don't know what textbooks they need until they start the course, this often means they they just go without. They either have to drop, they either decide to drop that course, or they just try to get by without the textbook, even if the textbook is technically uh, required to complete that course. And so, while things like pensioner discounts or payment plans are uh, is helpful. That's kind of a, a band-aid fix for a problem that's more fundamental. Uh, that the price of these resources are uh, unaffordable in the first place. And so one way of addressing this is to use more open education resources in the curriculum and make uh, use resources that are free for students to access. And as I was alluding to earlier, um, one of the one of the challenges is the way that the textbook market is actually set up in that students are effectively a captive market for large textbook publishers, in that these students have limited ability to decide whether to purchase a textbook. Although, as we'll see in a moment, many do decide not to purchase a textbook. Um, but also because of there being a very small number of uh, publishers providing this material, uh, there is limited ability for the anyone working within this market to actually uh, push back on some of these price increases. So we'll just see a video from Business Insider from 2018 that just talks a little bit around how textbook pricing works. And so you might be asking the question, but what about the library? Um, that's, that, that's uh, surely that's the role of the library is to provide this kind of free access to students um, rather than expect them to purchase these resources. But as, as it was alluded to in um, the previous videos, uh, commercial publishers are making it uh, increasingly difficult for libraries to provide free access to all the students who need them. And so for, to provide physical copies 
uh, is uh, to provide enough physical copies for all the students who need them is both unsustainable and unrealistic for, to, for libraries to be able to achieve. That's partly because of uh, the space that would be required to store all, all of these uh, resources as the cadence in which new editions are published uh, uh, the, the uh, increases in terms of the, the uh, frequency that these textbooks are published um, increases. There are more and more of them, uh, more and more courses taught and more and more students engaging with this material. It's, it's unsustainable and un, um, un, uh, impractical to provide physical access to these things, particularly as curricula become more um, digital first and digital focused and uh, hybrid. Uh, electronic resources are really the way that we're trying to, uh, libraries all around the world are trying to um, uh, prioritize. But commercial publishers uh, know this and uh, ha have had have, uh, pursued opportunities to make it difficult for libraries to, to provide electronic materials to students um, in a way of being able to protect that sort of profit margin that um, has been uh, protected for decades for textbooks. And so libraries are often provided with very expensive and restrictive options in terms of what license they're, licenses they are able to purchase to provide textbooks. So some people don't realize that libraries can't just purchase um, a copy that the average person can cop can purchase. So libraries can't just buy the ebook off of Amazon, for example. Um, libraries need to purchase uh, institutional licenses um, in order to provide these resources. And often these are far, far more expensive than it would take an individual to purchase. Uh, so, for, exa um, for example, the average textbook would, might cost around uh, $1,500 US to provide a three user license, which means three people can access that uh, book at any one time. And as we have courses with hundreds of students in it, and uh, some of those licenses aren't even indefinite, some of them are that amount of money for three users for 12 months, um, it becomes very quickly unsustainable to provide access to all the students. There's also the practice of packaging some of the more popular textbooks into expensive packages. So uh, the, it's, it's almost like uh, signing up for a uh, streaming service. You only have one show that you really want to see, but you have to pay the full fee anyway to see or to, to get all of this content you don't really need. Uh, there's a common practice for some of the more popular textbooks uh, that are required for large enrollment courses to be packaged with a bunch of other books that institutions don't really want. So there are some instances of uh, it, it, that it would cost something like $50,000 to buy an entire package of textbooks when all we really need is that one book that's set in a course. So that's also a challenge that libraries are having to navigate um, globally. And then, then there's also the restrictions on ebook e e use and access that are technically um, put onto these electronic resources. So this is often called digital rights management or DRM. And this, these are restrictions like the inability to download a book and read offline. Um, a lot of these do allow offline reading using special software. So using particular um, software like uh, Adobe Digital Editions, for example, is one. Um, that does allow offline access, but there's uh, certain restrictions in place. Um, and those that, that software is not always uh, accessible and usable for all students, depending on what devices they've got, if they need if they need to use particular assistive software in order to interact with it, interact with this content. Um, and so it's not um, always desirable. And in the, some of the research that we had, where we've, speak, we've spoken to our students, which um, I'll share in just a moment, some of those findings, uh, students do notice these restrictions and do consider them to be a burden in trying to interact with their courses. Um, uh, many students do point out the uh, issues that they have with trying to access a book through particular platforms. So see, these are some of the challenges that um, the libraries have in trying to provide this access to all the students who need it. And as I was just alluding to, this does impact on the student experience and the student success outcomes. So the price and availability of textbooks and readings do influence which courses students study in the first place. So in the research that we did speaking with students, 
40% of those students reported making decisions on which courses they decided to study based on the textbooks and course readings that they could see were set for that course, which is a large proportion of students. And this is consistent with research that has been done uh, internationally as well. But it's, it's, always, it's, it's often around 40% self-report making decisions on enrollment based on textbooks and course readings. Of those 40%, 60% decided not to enrol in a specific course because of the textbooks and readings that were set. So they had a look through the course outlines and just wrote a course off um, before even really looking much further into it, just based on the fact that it had a textbook. Again, of those 40% who made enrollment decisions, 44% took fewer courses in order to afford purchasing textbooks that they may have wanted to do uh, closer to full-time study load, but couldn't afford uh, couldn't afford purchasing all the resources that were required. And so they self-reported as having taken fewer courses. And 30% of those who made decisions on which courses to study uh, said that they dropped a course after having already started it because of the way the readings were used or the textbook that was set. And upon digging a bit further, some of those uh, were because of the cost of the textbooks and some of those were because of the, the perceived quality of, of what uh, how they thought that book was being or uh, resource list was being used in their course. So by being zero cost, OERs can make education more equitable for everyone by allowing, uh, by lowering that barrier of entry so that you don't have to purchase the resources that are part of a curriculum to engage with it uh uh you just have to pay the tuition fees um go through hex or that all that kind of thing and you can interact with the curriculum without having to spend extra money just to inter just to access the content on top of what they're already paying and so that's just one side of equity of the cost side and we'll cover some of the other bases in just a moment and in future webinars OERs also enable the freedom and flexibility of more diverse and innovative forms of teaching practice. Because they can be adapted and redistributed and shared, uh, OERs allow people to build upon the work of others. And so that we're not having to reinvent the wheel every time we need to create a new set of content for a course, just because the previous content is locked away behind sort of legal and technical barriers. By allowing work to be redistributed, we, you can have a collective commons approach to developing new knowledge and delivering learning and teaching material and allows you to shortcut a little bit. Um, if you need a new piece of content for your particular context, you can take material that's already out there, add to it legally and reshare that. They also allow you to remix and recontextualize content like I was just talking about. For example, you could take a book published in a North American context and adapt it to fit the Australian context. Perhaps there's a law textbook that works really well in terms of the way the material is presented and the structure of that text. But being an American law context, it obviously doesn't work in an Australian context, but perhaps there are elements of that that can be adapted to work in an Australian context. Um, similarly, there are resources being published around Australia where Australian Indigenous knowledges are being embedded within content that was sometimes published in Australia just without the First Nations material involved or sometimes published from elsewhere. Uh, and because open resources can be freely remixed and adapted and redistributed, some courses are using this as an opportunity to engage with students as partners initiatives and to collaborate with academic peers and students to enhance education. So some courses are using this as a form of um, re renewable assessment so that the students actually collaborate on the development of a text as part of their course, as part of their coursework. That text then goes into the next uh, cohort that they can use that as content to learn and they can then build upon that and collaborate to create new textbooks for future cohorts. So it allows course content and to be built into assessment and to be um, iterated in that in that way. And um, we'll see some of that in later webinars in a bit more detail. So just very quickly of where can you find OERs? Like I say, there's another webinar later that's a little bit more focused on, on this. 
One, one quick way is to go to library search, um, to go to the library homepage, uh, the university library homepage, and uh, do a regular search and then filter by open access. Uh, we have uh, many different open education resources uh, uh, repositories that come into library search. And so some of the bigger ones like Pressbooks, uh, OpenStax, uh, various other ones already come into library search automatically. Another way is to visit the library's open education resources webpage. So we have a tile on our webpage that says uh, find OERs. And that goes through to a whole list that we've curated, um, lists of OERs, but also places to search for OERs itself. Um, and you can also browse OER repositories and aggregators. Again, the best place is to actually go to our web page where we actually link through to a lot of these repositories and aggregators. But there's places like OER Commons and uh, Merlot and other places that actually bring open education resources published all around the web and uh, curate that and uh, aggregate that into one place for you to find and search and filter based on the particular content needs that you have. And finally, you can ask the library. So you can always email me. Uh, so you can also email the learning support team. So all of these links are on the web page there. We also have a form that's embedded within that page that allows you to provide some details if you have a particular um, textbook that you want to replace with an open resource. You can uh, put in the details and get some help from our team to find an alternative. Now, at this point, you might be wondering about quality. Now, surely commercial uh, traditional textbook publishers at least act as a gate, uh, as a checkpoint to check the quality of uh, the resources that are published. Uh, how can we ensure that the open education resources that are published are still high quality if they don't go through the same kind of checks that uh, commercial publishers uh, put their projects through? Um, the research has actually shown that open educational resources are at least as good, if not better, than commercial resources. Uh, this is according to a project called the Review Project. Uh, the link's just down there and in the chat, uh, which did a broad re literature review on what the evidence was saying about the efficacy of open education resources on learning outcomes and on the student experience. Uh, uh, it's The evidence isn't quite there yet for us to be able to say that open education resources are better than commercial textbooks. Uh, there still needs to be a lot more research done in this space, but we can say that they are at least as good, that they are no worse than commercial textbooks. And the reason for this is that many of the open education resources, particularly those that go through the more reputable open education resource publishing channels like uh, university uh, textbook publishing uh, programs, uh, many of these still go through a peer review process. In fact, it's a key part of the OER Collective's uh, publishing workflow, which we'll look at in just a moment. And many of the repositories and aggregators that you, where you would find these open resources include ratings, reviews, and comment systems so that you can see what peers are saying about those resources. So uh, if there's a resource that's particularly helpful, or or resources that are problematic, you should be able to see that through these ratings, review, and comment systems. Another reason that open education resources can actually sometimes be better quality than commercial resources is that they are more easily updated as content changes and can be more regularly updated without having to release a whole new uh, edition uh, through the traditional process. That can also be updated by anyone, but at least for those resources that are published in a way that allows adaptations. Uh, that can be updated by anyone who sees that there are updates that are needed and, and new additions are required. Uh, it, it's entirely possible that with commercial textbooks that they become out of date, but the initial author is uh, unable um, or unwilling for whatever reason to publish new versions of those textbooks uh, courses then are then left with old versions of those resources and don't even have the legal ability to build upon those and add new content themselves. While with open education resources, if uh, a particular uh, 
academic sees that the open textbook they're using is now out of date and a new version isn't forthcoming anytime soon, um, and if they have the interest and ability, they can actually take that resource, uh, create their own version, adapt it, add the new content, add the updated content and uh, tweak the things that need tweaking and release that new adaptation as a new version. So in this way, it's actually possible for open education resources to stay more up to date as subject matter changes uh, compared to commercial textbooks, which is the old saying that the textbook's out of date the day it becomes published. And in any case, all resources should be critically evaluated for quality and relevance before being used in curriculum, uh, regardless of whether they're openly published or not. The same processes that should be followed for checking that an open resource is high quality, that it's trustworthy, that it's unbiased, that it's actually relevant, and uh, speaking to the uh, learners at the point at which they need it. Um, all of these sort of checks should be uh, applied to whatever the resource is, to even if it's a commercial textbook. Commercial textbooks published through reputable publishers aren't necessarily always high quality either. Uh, so all resources should be critically evaluated for quality and relevance. Now let's move on to talking about the Open Education Resources Collective. The OER Collective is a program uh, facilitated by the Council of Australian University Librarians and the University of Adelaide is a member. Uh, the OER Collective includes 42 institutions from around Australia and Aotearoa New Zealand, uh, including the University of Adelaide, and includes a range of benefits, uh, 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 including collaboration and opportunities for publishing, and I'll get to those in just a second. Uh, the website is here and in the chat if you would like to explore uh, the Open Education Resources Collective and see what other institutions are involved. Some of the benefits that we get uh, from our membership of, of the OER Collective and that you get as uh, staff members at the University of Adelaide uh, include opportunities to publish open textbooks in Pressbooks. Pressbooks is an open textbook publishing platform that's built upon WordPress. So it might be familiar to some of you who have used WordPress or uh, related uh, content uh, editors before. Uh, they're online textbooks that allow you to add just, you know, traditional text and that kind of thing. But you can also embed videos, embed images. Uh, you can embed code for uh, programming based courses. You can embed H5P interactive activities. You can embed all kinds of things um, in Pressbooks. And it's they're one of the bigger open textbook uh, platforms at the moment. There are thousands of textbooks available through the Pressbooks directory. And a lot of them are very, very high quality and very, very uh, provide a good student experience. So through our membership of the OER Collective, we have the ability to publish textbooks through the OER Collective's instance of Pressbooks. So some institutions have their own that they their own instances of Pressbooks that they effectively use to uh, as the platform for their in-house open textbook publishing house. Uh, we don't have our own instance of, of that right at this moment, but we do get uh, two spots per year that we can use by being members of the OER collective. And both of those spots that we have available are uh, still up for grabs for 2024. Uh, it's not quite a first come first serve basis. There are a few priorities, uh, a few criteria that we go through to make sure that the textbooks that we're uh, helping create uh, useful to the students at the University of Adelaide and written by people who uh, are experts in that field and, and that we're getting effectively the best bang for buck for providing that support and providing that spot in press books. However, um, uh, I would highly encourage you if you're interested in publishing a textbook through press books to reach out and let us know and we can help you along that path. Um, if you want to use these spots, it does have to come through the university library. We do have to provide that approval and sign off to get you your spot in Pressbooks. Uh, but we're, we'd be very keen to get people to sign up. So um, yeah, reach out if you're interested. We also get access to grants for publishing open textbooks, which, which may be of interest um, to some of you uh, uh, attending this community of practice or watching the recording afterwards. The OER Collective runs annual an annual grant program 
Um, it's normally a few thousand dollars per project to uh, provide these, uh, to fund the development of open education resources. Uh, and I'll come to those, and uh, I'll come to that in just a little bit moment, and just a just a moment with a bit more information. We also get the opportunity to collaborate and learn from others through the OER Collective Community of Practice. There's this community of practice, it's very similar to, to ours at the university, but it involves representatives from across Australia and New Zealand, uh, practitioners in the open education resources space. So there are, there are academic staff, there are library staff, there are learning designers, there are all types of uh, staff in that group who share and collaborate uh, in the discovery, creation, and advocacy for open educational resources. There are a, a lot of institutions across Australia uh, a little bit more mature than the University of Adelaide is in terms of the, uh, the, the amount that they're engaging with the creation of open educational resources. So this is a really good resource for us to learn from others who are a little bit more advanced in the space and learn from their challenges and, and, uh, and what worked and what didn't for them. Uh, so this is a really good one to be a part of. And as a member of the uh, OER uh, collective, um, and if you are one of the academic staff who are creating a textbook for Pressbooks, you would also get access to this uh, community of practice. And the OER collective also provides templates and advice for creating open educational resources, uh, including the OER collective workflow and uh, comprehensive documentation for running a textbook publishing project from beginning to end, which I'll come to in just a moment. In fact, I'll come to it now. Uh, this is the OER Collective's publishing workflow. This is a comprehensive piece of documentation that provides advice for how to run an open textbook publishing project from beginning to end, and to make sure that all the right documentation and processes are followed to make sure that it's a smooth process and to make sure that um, things like intellectual property agreements are ticked off, uh, copyright is properly uh, followed and tracked, and uh, it, it, everyone, all of the stakeholders involved, all have a common understanding. Um, and, and also some of the technical aspects are in place to make these open textbooks discoverable um, to the wider uh, global community, which includes things like assigning a DOI, uh, uh, having the, the metadata that gets fed into uh, it's fed into the library discovery systems, making sure that that's all uh, filled out properly. Uh, so all of this is covered by this workflow. And the library is here to help guide you through this workflow. So we're, we're pretty familiar with this and uh, we can help you gu guide you through this every step of the way. It has, that said, it has been designed to, to be easy enough for an uh, academic staff member to follow themselves in a self-publishing kind of way. Um, however, the library is here to help you with this. So you don't need to be an expert at all of these stages. And in fact, um, uh, you can almost take it as it comes of uh, following this workflow step by step, and then learning about the next stage of the workflow as your project gets to that point. There are regular checkpoints through that workflow to make sure. So things like copyright that need to be checked throughout the process. Uh, there are checkpoints when you're following this documentation that reminds you to check. So, um, so it's, it's really well designed in that way. And uh, people from the University of Adelaide had a part in helping to co-create this workflow. And there's a link here uh, on the slide and in the chat that you can follow to learn more. The OER Collective's catalogue the list is the list of all of the open textbooks published through the OER Collective so far. So this is over the last few years since uh, since 2022. Uh, there's been around 29 published so far. And in fact, the most recent one was only published yesterday, I believe. Uh, this is the catalog of, like I say, all of the texts published through the OER Collective. So these are all relevant to the Australian and New Zealand context. All of the textbooks that are in this OER Collective's catalogue are also automatically discoverable through the wider Pressbooks directory, which has thousands of textbooks from all across the world that universities all around the world use. So as soon as a text is published through this uh, platform, it's also discoverable by 
teaching academics and students and universities from all around the world to be able to be used. So there can be a lot of visibility um, getting published through this way. You can access the link there again um, so that you can explore it in your own time and see if there are any texts in there that may be useful for yourself or colleagues to start using or even to take and adapt and create your own version. Most of these texts can be freely adapted and uh, I'm sure the authors would actually encourage others to either contribute to the development of a new uh, edition in a collaborative way or just to take and adapt um, in a way that suits them. Now, you may be wondering, uh, this is interesting, but why would I publish open an open resource? Um, what is the incentive that do that academic staff and other uh, subject matter experts have for creating open textbooks? Well, for one thing, you can help contribute to the growth and development of OERs in Australia. So one of the challenges that we have is it's like a two-sided market problem in that we want to encourage the adoption and use of open resources in the curricula because that helps uh, make the edu educational offerings more equitable for students and provides all of the benefits that I've already spoken about, but making the teaching practices more flexible and innovative and uh, 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 allowing a greater diversity of students to interact with education. Um, but in order for us to do that, we need to have the open education resources uh, available to meet the teaching and learning needs. And that's one of the challenges that we have, that I'm having a lot of conversations where there are courses uh, where the course coordinator is very interested in using an open education resource in their course. It's just those texts for that particular subject matter just don't exist yet. And so that's a common challenge that we're coming across, that particularly for content that requires a, an Australian uh, viewpoint, an Australian uh, framing, uh, we are still effectively in uh, the infancy of trying to build that content base. And so by getting in now and helping to create this content, you are actually helping to actively build the development of open educational resources and open education practice in Australia. Um, effectively at the um, ground level. Uh, it's not completely brand new in Australia, of course. There have been a lot of initiatives before, but this we, we are really at a critical point of trying to push the development of this space in Australia. And like I've said before, uh, other, other contexts, uh, other places are slightly more advanced than we are in terms of uh, Canada and uh, the United States and places in Europe are slightly more advanced in terms of the central uh, support and government funding for these initiatives. Uh, but, we, but there is a lot of work happening right now in the Australian context to try and build the open educational uh, resources, uh, offerings that are available. And so, yeah, you can, um, by publishing open education resources, you can help play an active role in building the growth and development of open educational resources in Australia. And by doing so, you can help build, well, by doing so, you can build your own reputation in your discipline. I think a lot of people who have published traditional commercial textbooks before um, would say that the royalties that you get from publishing these commercial textbooks are rather negligible that uh, even though they are paid resources and commercial publishers do make high profits, large profits off of these textbooks, uh, the actual academic authors uh, don't really get that much of a share back from those sales. It may fund a few research activities. Um, it may fund attending a conference. Um, it, may offend, it may help fund a few bits and pieces of an academic author's work, but it's hardly life-changing money. And so some academic authors report what motivates them to contribute to um, develop open education resources and sacrifice that that, that uh, small uh, royalty income stream that they would otherwise have gotten from uh, uh, publishing open, uh, a commercial textbook is actually that reputation that they can develop within their discipline for creating this resource there's the potential for an open resource to have a much wider impact and wider reach across the world but um, because they are much more accessible and don't have that payment uh, barrier in the way of getting distributed. 
So it is possible to become uh, to build your reputation in this area and become uh, and become well known in in doing so. Open education resources also often allow the academic author to create to retain more control over how their content is used in future and also how they themselves can reuse their content again in future. A lot of publishing contracts that academic authors have to sign in order to publish commercial textbooks sign over most of their intellectual property rights to the publisher. And so even uh, there are cases where academic authors want to then publish new editions of their textbook or use that content in other ways, say in different formats. They want to now create a video series based on the content in their court in that textbook. Uh, I've been trying, I've been working with academic authors who actually find they can't do that uh, because the, their, their publisher uh, doesn't give permission to do that. And they've already signed over their rights and there's, they've got limited ability to renegotiate that after the fact. But by publishing an open textbook, you can decide what open license you use and how many of those rights you're willing to give away. Uh, that's the real benefit of a Creative Commons license is that you do have a lot of uh, control over how open it is. Now, although I've said that uh, to be, say, a quote unquote, true open education resource, uh, people need to have the ability to freely download and share and reshare and uh, remix and adapt the textbook, uh, adapt, adapt the open education resource. It is possible to apply open, uh, Creative Commons licenses that restrict some of those uses. So you, you could you could use a Creative Commons license that restricts the reuse of your content in a commercial sense, um, for example. So you could make it that only non-commercial uses a uh, reuse would be allowed. You can you could uh, use a license that actually prevents adaptations of your text, so that your your resource can be uh, freely reshared, but it can't be changed or adapted. And you get a lot of freedom in 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 in. Uh, what you do there now all of these decisions come with pros and cons but you actually get to retain a lot of control and it also keeps it open keeps open the possibility for you to reuse that content in some kind of way you haven't signed over your rights to somebody else you also have the opportunity to contribute to the scholarship of learning and teaching so one of the challenges with open textbook publishing is that it more often than not, doesn't count towards uh, performance metrics for, say, for uh, uh, for academic promotions or uh, for measuring research impact uh, for other kinds of grant programs, uh, more sort of competitive research grant programs. However, some academic authors have used the opportunity of creating an open textbook to uh, create research outputs around the text. So that is, they create, they they um, do, do research on the impact of their open textbook or on the process of creating their textbook. And in this way, they are able to generate research outputs that are, that do count towards their research impact and can be counted towards uh, academic promotions and their academic workload. Um, uh, and using the open textbook development as effectively the content on which they're then doing their research. Now, recognizing this, this does create additional workload, of course, um, of having to do that research on top of the textbook development. Um, but it does. It, there are there is an avenue there of uh, being able to count this work towards your research output and research impact, and to also at the same time to contribute to the wider scholarship of learning and teaching. And finally, um, there's just that social uh, that, that uh, social good uh, aspect that some academic authors report as being their motivation for engaging with open education resources, and that's just um, that um, helping making education more equitable for everyone is a motivation in and of itself um, for some academic authors when they've reported on why they have decided to publish their textbook as open. So these are just some of the reasons why you might think about publishing an open textbook. Now, I suspect some of you uh, are here because you're actually particularly keen on this point. And 
through our membership of the Open uh, Education Resources Collective, our academic authors do have the opportunity to apply for grants to fund part of the publishing of their open textbook. This grant program has been running for the last few years now, and uh, around a dozen or so projects are selected each year to receive funding to help publish their open textbook. Now, unfortunately, the details for the 2024 grant rounds are still to be announced, so I, I don't have anything that I can share there yet. Um, I'm, I'm really hoping that the information is shared soon. But what, uh, what I can do is share some um, a little bit about the process from previous years, because I suspect this year will be similar, um, but I'm, I'm still yet to hear the details of how it will work for 2024. In previous years, there's been a focus on particular priority disciplines that have a particular problem with there being expensive, uh, restrictive textbooks, but that don't have the open resources available to act, act as viable replacements. So there's some areas like in law, um, there's a real big push within the OER collective to create more open textbooks in law in an Australian context to help meet those needs. There's also been a focus on awarding grants to textbooks that will meet large cohorts so that you maximize the number of students who benefit from the development of this textbook. So a large course can benefit, but that's but small cohorts can also benefit from these grants. There are also projects who have been funded based on um, their course, the, the textbook that they're developing, being in a particularly niche area where there aren't any open resources in that space yet. So maybe a course that's relatively small with a relatively small student base, but it is in an area that does actually need an open resource um, uh, to help benefit those students. And there's also been a focus on develop on uh, funding projects that are embedding Indigenous knowledges into their textbook in some way. That's also a, a, a focus on the OER collective. These grants are often used to buy out teaching or marking, so to provide the academic staff member with a little bit more capacity to develop their textbook, or it's also been used to do things like compensate peer reviewers or to uh, pay for professional copy editing and proofreading. Um, there's a few ways that grants have been used by previous grant recipients. Uh, it's normally around two or three thousand dollars, I think, per project normally gets funded. I think in 2023, around 12 projects received funding. Uh, there were $38,000 awarded in total for around 12 projects. Um, so it's not a huge amount of money. Like it's not like a life-changing amount of money that will be able to fund the entire project end to end, but it can be a really key piece, a really uh, key helpful piece of funding to fund certain aspects. And just to be able to report that you have actually received a grant in a competitive round to fund this project and adds a bit more um, it adds a bit more credence to the whole open textbook publishing project. Now, as I say, the details for the 2024 grants have yet to be announced by the OER Collective, but as soon as they are, I will be sharing this with everybody that's in our OER uh, community of practice and everyone who's registered for this webinar and a, a few other promotions as well. So keep an eye out. And Often the uh, turnaround time for these grants are often fairly short from the time that this, these are announced to when the submissions are due. So I would encourage you, if you are thinking of applying for these grants and you think you would benefit from getting an OER Collective grant, please talk to me um, talk to the, talk to me or talk to the team um, as soon as possible with what you're thinking about, because we can help develop a bit of a draft application before the formal announcement actually goes out so that we can just um, start at the front foot and we don't have to start from scratch. If at any point you have any questions about the grants, re reach out to me anytime and I'll see if I can get some answers for you. But the link is here if you like to explore that a bit more, which does include lists of uh, previous recipients and the kinds of projects that have won funding in the past. All right, well, thank you everyone for attending today or for watching this recording afterwards. Uh, if you have any more questions or if you have, uh, if you need any more information about open education resources or about the community of practice, you can follow this QR code or follow this link and you'll get to the open education resources page of the library. Uh, keep an eye out for information about future 
webinars. We'll be running another one next month. And uh, if you want to have that automatically into your calendar, please remember to sign up as a member of the community of practice. Again, all that information is on this page. Uh, thanks again and have a good rest of your day.